Good morning, New City Church. Uh, welcome to our service today. Uh, I'm Ken Holiday. if you don't know that. Um, we're very pleased today that uh, we're going to be sharing our service. It's going to be performed by our friends from uh, New City Church in uh, uh, Com City Church of Compton, not New City, City Church of Compton. And uh, Reverend Pat Dirksy will be uh, giving the message, and his service uh, worship team will be providing music. Uh, for you, a lot of you are familiar with the uh, City Church. Uh, I got involved starting probably about eight or nine years ago, the first time I went down there for a Compton initiative, and have been going down there regular ever since. And as a mission person, I've become our liaison point person with uh, City Church. And uh, it's been amazing to me going down there all these years to see how that church complex has evolved and changed and how the neighborhood has evolved and changed. And I think a good portion of that has to do with uh, Pat and the people at City Church. Uh, so I'm excited about that, uh, hearing him preach today. Uh, there's some exciting things they're going to be doing later on uh, after the service, and uh, Bill will tell you more about that later on. So um, I'll just say it's a wish to be able to see you in person one of these days, and I look forward to seeing you. Hope everyone is doing well. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there with them. And we believe the church is not a building. The church is made up of people. And so we've gathered in the places where we live to be the church. And we worship God together. We trust that he is with us and that God is at work among us wherever we are. And so God welcomes all the dreamers and even the doubters. He welcomes the warriors and the wanderers who will call upon him. So the psalmist writes in Psalm 105, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, and let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Let's pray. Faithful God, we're gathered together to hear from you, would you help us, Lord, to empty ourselves of the things that might hinder us from fully hearing what you have to say? And then would you fill us, we pray, with all that makes us the people that you want us to be? We invite you into, into our presence, by your presence, in this time of worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Bless your name, Lord Jesus. You're worthy. You're worthy. Worthy in this place. We give you all the glory, all the honor. Have your way in this place. Have your way. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. And everything that is within us, let us shout out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Such a good God. And we just thank you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, welcome. Thank you for having us. We are City Church of Compton, and it's awesome to be here. Yes, thank you. Just a little brief introduction. My name is Barack. This is Julie. This is Bernardo. This is Bree, and this is Slap J in the back. And it is such a blessing to be here with you all today. Hey, well, it's great, uh, Barry, to have you here today with the church. You're a teaching elder at City Church. Correct. And uh, I know that you were right from around this area, and I feel a little bad that you've been there two years and. <laughs> We've never really sat down and had uh -huh. a tell me about you kind of uh, conversation. But uh, I know you're married. Tell us about uh -huh. your two kids. Yeah, so I'm married to a beautiful Latina. Uh, my wife is Lisette Cunningham. Uh, I've been married for the last, <laughs> oh, I just had a blank there. <laughs> See, make sure we edit that part out, please. Um, yeah, we've been married since 2007. Um, and we have two beautiful children, uh, Nehemiah Cunningham, who is seven years old, a little boy, um, and my daughter is Charisma Marie Cunningham, and she's 10 years old. Oh, great. Hey, well, let's, let's go back a ways in your life. Just, I'd love to know kind of your story. Uh, grew up to be close to your mother, and then how did things go from there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I tell everyone that my story is probably the normal story um, in the inner city. Um, I was born to teenage parents. Um, yeah, grew up uh, in the inner city, in the city of Linwood and Compton. Uh, moved a great deal. Uh, and ended up with my grandparents, who kind of took us in to keep us out of a system, and wanted to try to give us a, a good upbringing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And, and then in terms of your faith life, how, how did that develop? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> strong grandparents, right? My grandmother is one who um, I believe brought me to faith in Jesus Christ. She was someone who was a prayer warrior and knew that, you know, the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Mm -hmm. And so she would pray and pray and pray uh, for our, our salvation, but just pray for protection and provision. And so one of my grandmothers actually worked at a Christian school in the cafeteria, at which we got a discount. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started very early on understanding truths about God and what he expected of us. Um, however, you know, in a quest for, I would say, acceptance, um, I made some bad decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that um, it, it's the decisions that um, many young children are faced with in the inner city. What do you do? Mm -hmm. um, how do you find acceptance? Um, who are your friends? Who isn't vested in your best interests? And so, yeah, you know, um, grew up in the city, got into trouble um, after high school, um, started to hang out with the wrong guys, right? Um, and was influenced, honestly, mm -hmm. um, into some bad life choices. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there a, a tipping point that, that came about? There was a tipping point. Um, so it, it feels like I can, I can see God's handprint on my life. There are some significant stories that took place. Um, when I was 18, fresh out of high school, I was a victim of a violent crime and was shot in a drive-by. Um, I ended up being in the hospital for three to four days um, with a bullet in my side trying to figure things out. Um, I believe God was trying to bring me back to him. Mm -hmm. Right, that story of reconciliation, right? Trying to get my intention and, 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 and set right this relationship. 
Um, and then uh, a few years after that, my cousin was murdered. And that was the tipping point. Wow. Uh, this guy was, his birthday was a couple of days ago, actually, August 12th. And uh, he was murdered. And it was in that moment I understood that life was fragile. Tomorrow wasn't promised. And we need to make our call in an election sure. Wow. How did you get hooked up with City Church? <laughs> uh, Pat and I both uh, went to church at Emmanuel in Paramount. Mm -hmm. Um, Emmanuel was a, a church that started its influence in my life about 14 or 15. My father lived close to the church. And so one of my best friends who, whose parents attended the church basically declared that if we were going to hang out and be friends, that we needed to go to church. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, that started my life at Emmanuel. But after um, my, co my cousin being murdered, I found my way back at the doors of Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Um, and just really surrendering to God. And, and then immediately some of the guys that had discipled me in the high school days were individuals who were basically saying, we think you're ready to do something more and give back and use all those testimonies that you have had from your crazy life to impact and connect with kids. And so I started high school ministries. Shortly thereafter, I met Pat. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And that's all she wrote. That's all she wrote. And <laughs> yeah. the next thing you know, he handcuffed me and brought me back to Compton. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. Hey, you know, I know Emmanuel Church, and I know uh, uh, it has an amazing testimony within mm -hmm. the community. You know, honestly, we're a very white church mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys have figured out <laughs> mm. a little bit, and, and in, at City Church, too, um, a, a, a great deal of the aspects of racial reconciliation mm -hmm. and bringing understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is just moving into the community yeah. uh, in that respect. But in light of, of what we faced as a country in the last couple months, mm -hmm. um, what, what would you say to uh, your white brothers and sisters in terms of some of the things that would help us be more sensitive and understanding? and? Uh, in a sense, repentant of maybe some of our attitudes that we've had in that respect. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good question, Bill. Um, and I, I believe it's very nuanced. Um, but from our experience, um, Pat and I were literally just talking about this in the car. Um, you know, my relationship with Pat wasn't formed out of some project. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, for him to fix me or me to get him to be a better pastor. Um, it was born out of the desire for relationship. Um, and when you have individuals who are committed to relationship, I think growth happens. Mm -hmm. You start to care about the other's perspective. It's mm -hmm. not only about you. Yeah. Um, and you start to believe some of the narrative from the other individual when it's your friend, yeah, yeah. right? And yeah. so a relationship um, has the ability to, 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 to bring about the change that I think we need. Um, I, I, I realize and I believe wholeheartedly that there is um, two sides of reconciliation, if you will. Um, there's the, the side that is between man and God, which is very vertical, but I think God also desires for our relationship to be restored. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so if we would just start to listen to one another and not have some cooked up, fixed up rebuttal, mm -hmm. but actually grieve with those that are grieving. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that has the ability to change, change so much. Yeah. One of my favorite Dieter Bonhoeffer mm -hmm. illustrations is that he said Christians are like porcupines in a snowstorm. OK. They need each other to stay warm. Mm -hmm. But if they get too close to each other, they mm -hmm. prick one another. Yeah. So yeah. Jesus is willing to stand between them mm. and to take upon himself the quills that we might inflict wow. to allow us to get closer wow. in that respect. And uh, mm. so uh, I, I think <laughs> the cross becomes the reconciling agent between Absolutely. us as well. Absolutely. So. That's beautiful, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You may have to send that to us one day to be reused. I think... Uh, I, I wish we had a lot more time to talk, but... Uh, but um, We will make time. Uh, yeah, and I know uh, we're going to hear a great message from Pat uh, in just a little while as well. Mm. 
But before we just close, could, could, could I ask you, could you pray for our church Absolutely. and our sensitivity to the needs of the world? And then Absolutely. I'll just pray uh, briefly for City Church as well. Absolutely. Let's Absolutely. Pray. Let's, Let's pray. pray. Then. Oh, Lord, you are such a good, good God. And um, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your, your heavenly mission, that mission that, that caused you to leave heaven and come to earth and reconcile man to you. I'm so thankful uh, for this reconciliation that we get to benefit from. But so often we, we, we stop there. And my prayer is that that wouldn't be um, the stopping point, but it would just be the starting point. Uh, you died, Lord, to, 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 to fix our relationship, but you also died for, for humanity to love one another. Uh, and so, Lord, would you empower New City? Uh, give them extra grace, extra mercy, uh, extra desire to step outside of comfort, uh, to step outside of the things that they know is normal, uh, and incline their hearts and their ears to the story of others. Um, you created diversity, and we shouldn't ignore it, but we should welcome it, we should accept it, and we should actually like shoot for it. And so would you just change our hearts where we have selfish motivations or when we're too inward focused? Help us to truly be about your mission. Help us to be about sharing the gospel message and making you known amongst the entire world. That's our prayer. And Father, uh, I always think about Jesus on the road to Emmaus when the other guy said, didn't our hearts uh, burn when he, when he was with us? And I, I have found my experience whenever I'm with Pat or, or other members of the, of the uh, city church community and uh, being on their grounds and watching the tremendous ministry that they have, my, my heart leaps. And I, I know why it does, because these guys are so genuine and authentic and they just love you so much. And it's like you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice, you squeeze a, a lemon, you get lemon juice. And when you squeeze these guys, you get Jesus all over. And so thank you for the fruit of the spirit that's so evident in their lives. Thanks for uh, the, the, the way they've basically laid their lives down to move into a community and to, to, to be your presence there and for the incredible, uh, almost miraculous things that you've done over the years to, to bring a, a, a clear witness in, in action to that community where they, where they serve. We pray your continued blessing on them. And I know that um, there are some things coming down the road here, even in the next couple weeks that will expand that ministry as well. And I, I, I look forward to seeing how you will orchestrate that. And I also look forward to see how our congregation might in some way uh, be a part of helping that. And so uh, with gratitude for Barry, his family, for Pat and his family, for Arnie and his family and the ministry they have, we give you praise and it's in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Father, kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy. Your promise.
promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Beautiful Savior. God, our strength and our redeemer. You've called us to be a people of prayer. And so we come before you with confidence, bringing our prayers to you and trusting that you hear us and that you'll answer. We pray for those who, like Jesus' disciples, find themselves surrounded by high winds and stormy seas. Those who've lost jobs, who've lost loved ones, who are facing illness or pain, and those who don't know where to turn. We pray for those who find themselves deeply wounded by people that they love, people that they thought they knew and trusted, and who are struggling to know how to respond. Loving God, we place before you our doubts and our despair. We offer you our hopes and our dreams. And through the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit, make your sustaining presence known to all of us who are in pain or need. And may we know your steadfast love in new ways and then share it with the world around us. As we pray the model of the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, good morning. It's so great to be with you. My name is Pat Dirksy. I'm the pastor at City Church of Compton. It's always so fun to, uh, to have this experience uh, every summer as we begin to come to, to New City and share a, a message and get to spend some time with you. Um, however, this year feels quite different. Uh, I'm staring at a camera and wish I was staring at your faces. I can feel like uh, Paul as he begins to write some of his letters and he says, oh, how I long to see you. How I long to be with you. And so hopefully we get to see some of your faces later today driving through the parking lot. Um, and, uh, and we'll look forward to, to waving and uh, doing an air fist bump or something where we get to see each other. But glad to share a message with you today. I uh, just want to share our passage. Today we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, um, looking at verses 11 through 21. So if you're looking on a device or the screen or wherever else, Um, Let's uh, lean in as we begin to hear these words from the book we love. And it says this, Since then we know that it is to fear the Lord we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are of right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, but And he also committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors. As though Christ were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. People of God, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I think it's uh, been very clear, even as you heard in the interview earlier, that we are living in a divided world. We're living in a world that uh, doesn't seem to agree on much uh, these days. And part of what we begin to see in this passage is this opportunity to call us to come and be reconciled to each other, calling for a different message than what we're oftentimes looking at of what side are you on? It's an either or world it seems like we're living in. And what we begin to to see is that um, Paul is beginning to to share a message. And part of it is to to take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. You see, what was oftentimes taking place is there were people going on ahead of them or in different areas. And there were false teachers who were concerned about getting ahead in the world. Oftentimes, these uh, false teachers might want to gain a good reputation or they're looking for some prosperity along the way to make some some money. And we begin to see while Paul and his companions preached more out of concern for the eternity of each person's soul. And so part of what we begin to look at is what's your motivation? What's your motivation? If they are more concerned about themselves, as we begin to see, than about Christ, who wants to begin to press people forward, into mission and sharing this good word. I just love the hearts of so many here at New City uh, Church. It's just so great to feel like you have pastors who are committed to the well-being of others. It is fun to know that your church has a reputation of asking the question, how can we help? Is there any way we can assist you guys? Is there any way we can come alongside? What can we do? Hey, we have this idea. 
hey, can you tell us some of the things that you begin to, to need? And so your pastors, Danny and Bill, are great examples of oftentimes asking this question, but it doesn't stop there. It is the people that I wish I was looking at here this morning and could give a high five to and a hug to because Brandon's beginning to express, hey, here's some gifts we can give to some people in your church. We begin to find that um, Ken and Linda get to be this consistent presence of wanting to begin to, to show up, to, to share good news and be good news from Christmas time to back to school. I mean, there's so many ways that you continue to show that your love for us. And so part of what we begin to see is, what are you fueled by? And it seems like you are fueled by the love of Christ. It begins to share right there in verse 14. For Christ's love compels us. We feel that when we engage in you, that it's not just your own enthusiasm along the way, but you're compelled by Christ's love to come and share a message. See, Christ's love begins to compel us because it's Christ's love that fuels us, because Christ died for us, and we are also dead to our old selves, that it's not who defines us anymore of who we used to be. Our past doesn't give us a definition for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, Christians are brand new people. They're brand new people from the inside out, and the Holy Spirit gives them a new life. They are not the same anymore. Some have liked to call this verse of uh, verse 17 here the butterfly verse, right? You are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. It's this metamorphosis that takes place, that we're no longer just, uh, you know, pushing through life on our stomach. We're not just kind of trying to push and just make it through life. But there's old ways that are gone, and we're flying into a new way of how we begin to follow Jesus. I think many times you begin to hear this turning point that begins to take place for people. It was mentioned in Barry's story that he just said, I made some bad decisions. I think every one of us at some point has to look at our life and say, I've made some bad decisions. Um, you don't need to have a unique life to, to be talking about getting shot or belonging to a gang or making um, you know, certain family dynamics. Every one of us at some point in our life has to look and say, I made some bad decisions. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I made some bad decisions along the way. But what we begin to see is there's a new creation that can begin to come. There's a turning point. It's getting into your cocoon and beginning to fly out at some point. There's this turning point of being a new creation that begins to come along the way. Maybe we can ask ourselves, uh, when we have this turning point, it's almost as if we have a new operating system. I think many of us work with computers every day. Um, many of us are Zoomed out and Zoom fatigue and all that goes with it. And you're watching another uh, opportunity here today in a service, and yet... We all have beginning to know that when you get um, a new computer or when you say yes to following Jesus, the operating system of how you live becomes brand new. And it's maybe our 1.0, right? Here's brand new operating system. But if the call is to be a new creation, maybe some of the things that I can wonder about is when was the last time you've been updated? When's been the last time that are you on 1.2 or if, does it feel like you've hit milestones in your life and you go, wow, I'm, I'm no longer like that anymore, praise the Lord. I'm no longer like that anymore. And oftentimes we have these moments of maybe getting married or a birthday or having kids or this milestone that we begin to have. And we go, things have to change. And the call is to come to Jesus. I can remember as a kid growing up uh, in Wisconsin, um, and being in Wisconsin, we don't have the mountains like we do here in Southern California, but we do get a lot of snow. And I remember making a, a good snow ramp with my friend, and we were trying out our snowboards uh, for the first time. And my friend Seth went down the hill, and as he went over the jump, he did the flying backwards, and he lands with his hand in back, and it wasn't good. When uh, when he pulled his glove off, it was very clear that we needed to call an ambulance. Uh, he needed to go see a doctor because that was clearly a break that took place on his wrist. 
And part of what we begin to, to see is that the call that we begin to have as followers of Jesus is a call to reconciliation. The word reconcile literally means to mend a broken bone. It's, you begin to look at it and go, ah, that's, that's not right. <laughs> um, we can't keep operating this way. It clearly needs to be set again. And one of the things we begin to find is that we begin to follow Jesus. There are times that we might have a feeling or we look at things and we go, this, this isn't right. Something needs to get set. There needs to be healing that takes place here. And initially, um, it, it might hurt a little bit to have some of these ouch conversations. But in doing so, we begin to find that we're, we're now mending a broken bone. We are beginning to heal what's been hurting. I know for us, when we first moved to Compton, we began to find that there was so much fear present on our street. And that oftentimes we were looking for ways to connect people again. So we were doing barbecues and Compton Initiative Days and trash pickup. And this all get to be opportunities for us to begin to, to come together. And as we come together, we begin to find like, hey, fear's going down. We're better together. Community is a gift. And it felt like even small moments like this of picking up trash and moving things to a dump, dumpster and painting houses and the many ways you've helped, it's an opportunity to bring things together again, to mend some of the fractions we have begun to have, to have ways in which we can come together again. One of the, the ways, too, of, of where's the starting point of how we begin to come together? Maybe I want to illustrate that with uh, just a story. Uh, my wife was so excited just under a year ago uh, to find out that someone was going to, to uh, give their piano to us. Um, someone called and said, is there anyone in need of a piano? And she was excited. My wife loves to worship. She's part of the worship team. She wanted to teach our kids uh, how to play the piano. And so... We heard it was a good name brand. We picked it up. We brought it home. Uh, it's been sitting in a house for a long time. We unloaded it off the truck, got it inside the house, and she plays a few keys, um, and she's excited to have a piano, but it was her ear is going, it's out of tune, which could be expected. So we began to, to call someone, and it took a long time for them to finally get there, and when they came, um, they had their tuning forks, right? That's kind of the old school way of doing it. Now everything's digital. And they brought, you know, their tuner to begin to tune the piano. And as he played every one of the keys, it's like this whole thing is uh, off by a quarter to a half. Now you can tell I'm not the music guy. I don't know what a quarter to a half means. But it was a long ways off and it needed to be, um, needed to be fixed. But he said, this isn't the greatest piano. And since it hasn't been tuned for a long time, I'm probably going to break some of these strings and it's probably not even worth the replacement of new strings for you to keep this piano. Now, we weren't ready to get rid of it, um, and so we've been looking for the next piano. It's still in our house right now, uh, but we have our kids who will play on it, and they can think it's okay. Um, over the months, we've had different people come into our house, some who have played piano, and it's interesting that they sit down and they begin to play, and they go, oh, it's, it's not bad, it, I, it's manageable, but for my wife, who has a great ear, and for a piano tuner who has a great ear, goes, this is off. You can't really be playing this. This isn't going to sound right to people. And it begin to see on the passage that, that God is calling us to a ministry of reconciliation. But the starting point for every one of us to be reconciled is to first come back to Jesus. We don't just all try get along and be good with each other along the way um, just by trying harder and hoping for the best and you might believe this and I believe that. But it has to start with having this perfectly tuned. To have something that can begin to hear and go, this is off and it needs to be aligned to this way. And not everyone begins to, to have, everyone can have their own opinion, but we begin to move to a spot of Jesus is the center point for us. Jesus is the spot for us to begin to hear correctly. Jesus is the spot who begins to show us the way in which we begin to live. And so we get reconciled first from a perfect source, Jesus. And we're all going to make our mistakes after that perfect source. But we get unity as we first get reconciled to Christ. 
that God brings us back to him. That part of it for us is to be Jesus bringing us back to him and blotting out our sins. We begin to hear this even from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was create, to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. See, part of the first call is to come back to Jesus. The fancy biblical word for this is covenant, right? That we are no longer enemies of God or strangers or foreigners to him when we trust and belong to Christ. Because we have been reconciled to God, we have this privilege of encouraging others to do the same. So the great thing is we're first called the relationship. God calls us in on this sweet deal for us to begin to, to join him and be reconciled to him. But yet the passage goes on to just not say you're a spoiled kid to just enjoy these good things. He's calling you to have a message to share. Listen to, to what it begins to, to, to share to us in verse 19, that you are ambassadors. An ambassador is an official representative on behalf of one country to another. As believers, we are Christ's ambassadors, sent with his message of reconciliation to the world. Ambassadors have an important responsibility because they represent the one who sent them, right? And so kingdom is all about representing someone. So there's this kingdom of God, and we begin to represent Christ in the world to begin to share this message of mending a broken bone, right? Mending those things that that aren't right. Barry talked about not only do we have to be reconciled in our relationship to God, but when we first get reconciled to with God, we get tuned in to how he begins to see life. We can reconcile with others. And this is the call that we begin to have because the best ambassadors are those who understand the great exchange they got to go through. It says in verse 21, here's the, the, the change. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our sin was poured out into Christ at his crucifixion. It is the great trade, to say the least. I mean, I guess um, if God isn't good at something, it might be negotiating, <laughs> right? I mean, if... Uh, if people call our catering business at times, and when they call, they, they oftentimes ask what the price is, and after the price, they typically want to negotiate. And so if I tell them, hey, a rack of ribs costs $25, I rarely have people say back to me, you know what, I'm going to give you 50 And yet, this is the great exchange that God begins to give to us, that we come with our sin, completely worthless, nothing much to have here, and he comes with his righteousness that's completely immeasurable. And when you understand how bad you've had it, you also begin to understand how good you got it. And this is the great exchange that begins to take place. Not only uh, are you one who to receive a message, but also you get to go and give a message. I know for, for me in high school, uh, while I probably had an older brother and cousins and parents who kept me in check, probably internally, I felt young and cocky. I probably felt arrogant and proud. And I thought I would probably be able to bring about change in different areas. But as I get older, I find that um, some of the hard knocks of life pushes a lot of this out of you. And I I've also feel like the many places I used to push towards risk, I'm no longer pushing in many ways. I mean, I used to jump off the back of pickups. Now I turn around and I cautiously step off, right? I mean, you grunt putting shoes on. Some of the physical activities you used to do, you no longer are doing. But yet, I also find that beyond the physical, as we get older, it feels like so much of what we begin to do 
pushes more towards security and comfort. It feels like oftentimes as life goes on, there seems to be more habits uh, that begin to, to go of repetition that we feel comfortable in. And I wonder about becoming new, that if we're a new creation, what gets to feel like the ways we push beyond what we're used to experiencing? What gets to be ways that we begin to, to feel like we might play it safe rather than push beyond uh, what we thought we could do? What are the immeasurable ways that God wants to see in our life? There's a quote that I like from Marianne Williamson, and it begins to, to talk about some of our deepest fears. And I think maybe as I was younger, I used to be able to think I was going to accomplish so much, but maybe you can connect with some of this uh, quote as well. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is the light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so others, people, won't feel insecure around you. You were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I just love the, the testimony we got to hear earlier from Barry and, uh, and the, the opportunity of him and, and, uh, and the conversation that he began to, to have because Barry would say that he used to be someone in our community that took things. But yet now we see him as an ambassador who is giving to the community. He probably would say there are parts of his life that he didn't have an example. But he can be one who is setting an example for those in our community to be following that he's setting an example in his conduct, that he's setting an example in the way that he parents his kids, the way that when she loves his wife, the way that he's committed along the way. You see, it's been a gift to know Barry because it's brought healing to me, but I watch him bring healing to so many others. I mean, um, when Barry said I handcuffed him, uh, you can see by his size that I didn't handcuff him and get him to Compton. Um, but I think what we begin to see is that there's so much healing that's taken place from our relationship together. But I've also watched Barry engage with so many others. And with his presence that he begins to have that's big, I see him begin to serve so many others. With a smile, with engaging in words, with a hug, with, uh, with so much that's taken place because he is, um, like all of us, someone who's been wounded, but he is a wounded healer, and he engages others along the way. And so he doesn't just live life as one who shares a story of what once happened, of a turning point because of tragedy that strikes, but he's been an ambassador. He's been one who begins to represent others out in the world, and I just want to challenge you to do the same thing as we begin to live, is, is what is the new thing that God is doing? For you? What's the, what is the upgrade you begin to have to say that I'm different than I was a year ago because of Jesus and the things that he's done? So we just pray that we begin to, to live into that today. So let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to participate in your ministry. Uh, we are just delighted by this great exchange that we get to have, that you invite us in to be a part of uh, this great deal our sin, for your righteousness. And so because we start out life guilty and because we get to experience your grace, may we begin to move today to live with gratitude, to share with others the good things that you're doing. So come, Lord Jesus. To your name we pray. Amen.
So go now, telling the world all that Jesus has done for you. Be united with each other in Christ. Wait for the Lord and be ready to hear God's voice, even in the sounds of silence. And may God be your strength. May Jesus Christ free you to live without fear. And may the Holy Spirit bring you light and truth to sustain you this week as you love and you serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Have a great week, everybody.